Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome back to Wednesday Night at the Lab, Jonathan Patz. He's the director of the Global Health Institute uh, he was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and he went to high school there at the Friends School in Baltimore. Then he went to Colorado College, where he majored in biology, and then went to Case Western Reserve, where he got his MD degree. He got his Master's of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University, and he's been here for quite a while since then. He's board certified in occupational environmental medicine and in family medicine. Tonight, he's gonna talk with us about how might solving the global climate crisis also create the largest human health benefit of the century. This is my, in my opinion, the greatest example of turning, turning lemons into limoncello that I've ever seen. I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Patz back to Winston Thank you. Thank you. Tom, it's a, a real pleasure to be here, and it was great that we bumped into each other in that blizzard the other day and a little while back. I said I would only talk about climate change in the summer, not in the winter, so here I am. Thank you all for coming. Um, you all know about climate change and the global climate crisis and how dangerous it is for human society, and I'll talk about how climate change is a human health issue but solving the problem, I will show evidence why this could be the greatest opportunity of our lifetimes. Now, of course, uh, climate change is not um, fantasy. It is real. It's not your imagination that summers are getting hotter. I'm gonna show you from James Hansen. This is surface temperature in the northern hemisphere and looking at summertime, this is average summertime temperature for the year uh, 1951 to 1980. And as you look at these years go forward, look especially at the extreme temperatures. Right here, very few. So here we go. Temperatures from 1951 to 80, 83 to 93, 94 to 2004, 2005 to 2015. It is not your imagination, it really is getting warmer. And there are consequences we're seeing around the world. This is looking at Greenland's uh, uh, ice is melting four times faster than, than was thought. And that would mean, as far as Greenland, if Greenland melts, that's 23 feet or seven meters of sea level rise. But Greenland is a lot smaller than the Antarctic. Uh, if the Antarctic melts, that's 57 meters or 180 feet of sea level rise. Um, and the Antarctic is losing six times as much ice as it was four decades ago. So we're seeing what is happening as the Earth is, is heating up. But if you live in Wisconsin, there's a little cautionary note, you know, global climate change, uh, it, it requires a global perspective. What impression do Wisconsin residents have about global warming after experiencing nearly three weeks of sub-zero temperatures throughout the region? And of course, all of you now know about the term of the polar vortex. It's because the jet stream uh, slows down as the temperature difference between the Arctic and lower latitudes gets smaller. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as anywhere else on Earth. So as the Arctic is warming, there's less temperature difference by latitude. And that's what, what drives the jet stream. This is uh, co-discovered by Dr. Steve Vavris here at the University of Wisconsin in the Center for Climatic Research in the Nelson Institute. So as the as the um, jet stream slows down, it gets wavier, and you can see that, you know, 
this is what we saw, the, the Arctic temperatures dipping way south. But notice at either end of this extension of Arctic air, up here it's really warm. They were canceling dog sled races in Alaska this past winter. So extremely hot temperatures where you don't expect it here, and extremely cold temperatures as the Arctic is, is disintegrating and the Arctic air is going further south. Uh, this past winter, I was lecturing out in Bozeman, Montana, which is farther north in latitude. And on, on Saturday, January 26, I was on the other side of the polar vortex. It was plus 36 degrees Fahrenheit in Bozeman. At the same time, it was negative 24 in Madison. 60 degrees Fahrenheit difference in temperature on, on one side of the polar vortex. So this is, again, what we, what we experienced. And there were a few people that experienced the cold, especially in the United States. And you heard a few individuals say, we could sure use some global warming. It's so cold. But if you look at this map, um, and this is the same thing happened two years ago. We had a polar vortex. Which color is dominating the globe, the extreme cold blue or the extreme hot orange? And so this is why it's so important that people understand it's a global issue, the global climate crisis. You can't look outside of your window and say, aha, it's cold or it's hot. I know what's going on around the rest of the globe. It really, it's about global averages and why it's so important that when it's a polar vortex in Wisconsin, ask yourself, what's the temperature in Alaska or in Finland at the same time? And you'll know, you'll get the answer, it's probably extreme hot. So what about the future? <clears throat> this is from the uh, United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I served on the UN IPCC for 15 years, um, which was really a great thing. Uh, to be part of, and the United Nations IPCC is projecting that best case scenario, if we have uh, representative concentration pathways, RCPs, of not so much more greenhouse gas emissions, so we cut off fossil fuels and we, we calm down and we don't burn so much uh, dirty energy, well, we'll still, we'll still warm on average about one degree centigrade. But if we continue as business as usual, this is a higher representative concentration pathway of greenhouse gas emissions, the Earth will on average warm seven degrees centigrade uh, by the end of the century. Seven degrees average warming for the globe is huge. And remember that the world is mostly ocean, so land, land surfaces, will continents, will be warming even more. This is extremely extre extremely rapid warming. And at the moment, uh, it's our fossil fuel emissions, we are trending worse than this worst case scenario, according to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, you, you, you're going to have some climate lectures uh, at Wednesday Night Labs and things on sea level rise and flooding. Um, I'm a health person, so I ask the question, you know, climate change, and what does that mean, you know, when you look at rising temperatures, sea level rise from thermal expansion of salt water, and also land-based glaciers sliding into the ocean, but also extremes of the water cycle, hydrologic extremes, more droughts, floods, and fires. That's, those are the physical attributes of climate change. For me, I say, well, so what? And for me, the so what is that there are so many pathways through which climate affects our health. And every single one of these pathways has these health outcomes and, and multiple climate sensitive diseases. It's why I have studied this topic for more than two decades. I actually co chaired the first US national assessment to Congress the health report of the National Assessment on Climate Change to, conference, uh, to, to Congress, because I think climate change represents the greatest public health challenge of our times. 
when you think about so many ways, be it from direct heat waves uh, that kill people to air pollution, stagnant air masses and heat waves, and the effect of air quality uh, on aero allergens and ground level smog ozone, to more biologically mediated impacts of climate change through infectious diseases, especially carried by vectors like mosquitoes and ticks, insect vectors that carry vector-borne diseases. And if we're thinking of extremes of the water cycle, more flooding and contamination and waterborne diseases. And of course, our health depends on adequate water resources and food supplies. So major climate-sensitive health outcomes and why climate change is, a, is absolutely a human health issue. Now on the bottom, I'll talk briefly at the end about mental health and climate change. Uh, and this bottom issue, environmental refugees, may be one of the toughest things to understand. You know, what was it, the extreme flood or drought that drove people out of their country or the corrupt politics? Very hard to disentangle. Personally, I think this issue of environmental refugees and displaced populations will be the iceberg under the tip of the iceberg. It will be a huge disruption to human civilization. One example, um, I don't expect you guys to read these graphs, but I'll just interpret that the top graph is looking at uh, rainfall, falling rainfall in Syria. This is a few months before their civil war. Falling rainfall, increasing temperatures, and the drought Palmer index showed that Syria experienced the most severe drought in its instrumental record, according to the study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it was documented that rural to urban migration was four to five times higher than normal. People were flooding into the cities because of the extreme drought. There were food price shocks, there were riots in the street. We will never know and be able to prove that that severe drought caused a civil war and hundreds of thousands uh, of deaths and millions of refugees. But it's associations like this that are pretty strong associations that happen over and over again where we ask the question, such climate extremes and the stress on natural resources and how it disrupts civilizations could really be destabilizing and you know, a very indirect effect, but maybe one of the largest effects of climate disrupting civilization. Let me just pause on the, the, the most common issue and the concern of temperatures, you know, rising temperatures. <clears throat> um, you all know about that heat waves kill people. The um, heat wave in Europe in 2003 estimated to have killed 70,000 people in 11 days, a public health disaster. Uh, we've done some modeling. Uh, this is with Dan Weimott of the, uh, climatic, uh, the Center for Climatic Research here at UW, showing that right now, New York City has on average 11 days that are 90 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or 30 degrees centigrade or hotter. So, thir so 13 days right now, um, right here, this under the curve, 13 days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. By mid-century, 40 years from now, New York will have a tripling in the number of hot days over 90. And we found this, uh, this was true for all cities we looked at east of the Mississippi. Milwaukee will also see a near tripling of the number of days that are over 90 degrees. So it's these extremes in uh, temperature, um, the increased frequency of extreme events that we're really concerned about, and, and it shows up in the modeling. Now, this is a picture during the Chicago heat wave. Were any of you in Chicago in 1995? During the heat wave, it killed 700 people. Notice the air quality. We, we published this in the journal Nature, and they subtitled, it was just on the cover, and they subtitled this um, The Wheezy City because they thought our paper was on air pollution. Our paper was on heat waves. 
And during a heat wave, you get stagnant air masses. And it's estimated that a quarter to a third of the deaths during heat waves are because of exacerbations in air quality. Um, we've done modeling studies of air pollution and climate. Uh, ground level smog ozone is very temperature sensitive. So that brown haze smog is temperature sensitive. That, there are models that show that that will increase um, with climate change. Now let's look around the world, estimates for future summer temperatures. And uh, the top map is mid-century. Let's focus on the bottom map, which is by the end of the century. Everything in this dark red color will have a 90% probability or greater of having their hottest summer in history. And what's concerning, especially in tropical regions, is that when you're growing crops within a climatic envelope, so it can't, you don't want it to be too cold or too hot to grow food, that these extreme temperatures will be devastating for crop yields. And this was uh, published in the journal Science uh, about 10 years ago. And similar studies are reinforcing these results that estimate that today's 800 million people at risk for hunger, hunger could double by mid-century. That's a public health crisis when you think about that effect. But I do have some good news. <laughs> Thinking about all these crop failures, there are some plants that will benefit from higher temperatures and more CO2. How many of you like ragweed and poison ivy? <laughs> so poison ivy does well. Ragweed pollen does well with more CO2 and warmer temperatures. And uh, this is a study from my, my hometown. Sorry, I'm not from Wisconsin. My hometown of Baltimore, where they planted um, ragweed plants on top of the Baltimore Science Center. Uh, that that's uh, the demonstrated right uh, here we are, right here, and uh, and then in the suburban area and a rural area, basically in the in the downtown urban core, it's warmer, urban heat island effect, and there's more CO2 from traffic. So ragweed plants produce much more pollen under those conditions of higher temperatures and more CO2 compared to the rural areas. So. Uh, we were part of a study. Wisconsin is monitoring ragweed pollen on top of the hospital, on top of the uh, roof there. And if you look at ragweed season across the United States, notice that, uh, especially in the northern latitudes, ragweed pollen season has increased two or three weeks. You know, 24 days here. Wisconsin, it's increased 13 days. So ragweed pollen season is 13 days longer in Wisconsin. And we've seen, of course, the Northern Hemisphere, CO2 has increased 27%. Wisconsin has warmed since the 1950s by, by one degree Fahrenheit. So increases in ragweed <clears throat> pollen, and that's a problem for children who have asthma. But of course, global warming's greatest threat may also be the smallest. Now, what is being conveyed in this this uh, slide, um, what is the difference between us mammals and that mosquito on the slide, besides the fact that, that we can't fly? And Tom guaranteed me that at least 85% of you do not suck blood. <laughs> so we are warm-blooded. Our body temperature is always about the same, but mosquitoes are cold-blooded. So whatever the air temperature is around that mosquito, that's her body temperature. And if she's carrying dangerous parasites that cause malaria or, sleep, or all sorts of different diseases carried by mosquitoes, the temperature determines the development rate of the pathogen inside the mosquito. This is a particular mosquito species. Unlike the malaria mosquito, which is the genus Culex, this is, um, I'm sorry, uh, Anopheles. Culex carries um, West Nile virus. 
Anopheles mosquitoes carry malaria. Culex mosquitoes carry uh, West Nile virus and um, equine encephalitis. This is 80s Egypti mosquito, which carries yellow fever, dengue fever, and Zika virus. Um, dengue fever is the most prevalent mosquito-borne virus in the world, and it's the same family as Zika virus. When Zika virus erupted in Brazil and Colombia, um, the climatic conditions were very unusual. In fact, just prior to the Zika virus epidemic, which coincided with one of the largest dengue fever epidemics, you can see El Nino. Um, El Nino of 2015 brought historic high temperatures into the regions. Temperatures, according to our analysis, were two standard deviations higher than a, a constructed 50-year average. So it was really hot. And the ability of that mosquito to carry <coughs> dengue fever and Zika virus was at its highest level as far as a biological transmissibility of these viruses was at its highest level because of these hot temperatures. Now, it's not, the temperatures are not everything. There's international travel, and how did Zika get to South, Africa, South America in the first place? Probably from international travel. But the extreme climate, uh, we think, had something to do with uh, the emergence of Zika in, southern, in uh, South, Af uh, South America. Quick reminder, it's not just about temperatures. Climate change is about extremes of the water cycle. Uh, we have noticed that in Wisconsin, and I noticed your next Wednesday night lectures on flooding. Um, this is the Kickapoo River last year. Big problems, big flooding problems for Wisconsin. And this is not new. You know, we know that we have problems when we have extreme heavy rainfall. But with climate change, the, the issue is that it's not necessarily going to rain more or less in a particular time. Because hot air holds more moisture, when it rains, it can rain really hard. So this is showing that you know, future projections with climate change, you know, it's the type of rainfall that is going to be increasing, the heavy downpour events will be increasing. And this is looking, uh, modeling across the, the globe, that when it rains, it will pour. We've studied what the effect is for water quality. And right now, in Chicago, um, you get these combined sewage overflow events. You know, when it rains too hard, there is contamination. We modeled the Chicago uh, water basin and found that there would be, by by the middle of the century, because of more extreme heavy rainfall, a doubling in the number of these combined sewage overflow events. So strains on water contamination. And if any of you are from Milwaukee, you know the problems when it rains too hard and you get you know, the, the rainfall and runoff that goes out into, the, um, into Lake Michigan, into the bay there. My colleague, Dr. Sandra McClellan at UWM, she goes out and dips for bacteria, for E. coli bacteria, after every rainstorm that Milwaukee has. And if you can notice, you know, these blue, flaming blue hot colors are right here at South, uh, South Shore Beach, and flaming red hot high counts of E. coli bacteria on Bradford Beach. Don't go swimming at these beaches after a heavy rainstorm, because there's risk of recreational exposure. So it's not, um, not surprising that increases in heavy rainfall are going to threaten our, our water and, and, in this case, recreational safety with water. So when we think about climate change, you know, too often we think of climate change as an environmental risk. And you see the picture of the polar bear. You know, I would argue that really, you know, these, these are the new faces uh, of climate change. You know, it's, climate change absolutely is a human health crisis, uh, looking at asthma, diarrheal disease, refugees, but also uh, mental health. 
Uh, not only do climate disasters cause post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, but um, there is now evidence of pre-traumatic stress disorder. People are becoming very anxious about the looming crisis. So I'll shift gears and take a sip of water because I get choked up about this. <laughs> so there's another element here, and it's this is an ethical challenge. Um, <clears throat> we wrote a paper 12 years ago calling <clears throat> climate change and health the greatest ethical dilemma of our times. If you look at these data-driven cartogram maps, on the bottom what we see are climate-sensitive diseases, malnutrition, diarrheal disease, malaria, those three in particular. What countries are already experiencing increasing increases in these climate-sensitive diseases? It's these poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa, India. But then the question is, who's actually causing climate change? Who's emitting the most greenhouse gases in the world that's causing the problem? And you can see that's the top map. This is a 50-year aggregate of, of CO2 emissions. Africa's not causing the problem. The United States is the number one contributor historically to greenhouse gas emissions. And so for today's climate change, the United States is the number one most responsible country. Now, China is out polluting us now. And in a few decades, they may become number one, although they're also number one in solar energy investment and technology. So they're sort of hedging their bets. Uh, but right now, uh, per capita, Americans are very responsible for this problem that we have globally. On average, we emit six times more CO2 per person than an average global citizen because of our energy consumption. So after publishing this, we, um, this got a lot of visibility. And I found myself in front of His Holiness the Dalai Lama showing him that exact map and explaining to him how climate change is a health issue. And that in many, you know that people are dying from climate change for all sorts of things that I, all sorts of health outcomes that I just showed you, and you know he's a very smart man and he he said Jonathan, if you know that pollution kills, your country is not showing much compassion, correct? <laughs> At which point I got choked up a little bit, <clears throat> and I said you know. I started to say it's complicated, but I decided not to say that. Um, and I started to say, you know, we are a fossil fuel-based economy, and we didn't know that air pollution was bad. Actually, you know what? I think I did say this, because I said, we didn't know that air pollution was harmful until after the killer London smog episode of 1952. And then we, you know, we got smart about it. And then he looked at me and said, yeah, well, how long have you known that, about climate change? And I said, well, just about 25 years ago. And he said, 25 years ago, you guys should be doing something by now. Well, I told him I would get back to him. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought about his challenge. Like, you know, it's, it's such a devastating crisis, and you're killing people. Why aren't we doing something? What's so hard about it? So I, I went to the, the 2015 uh, 21st Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the big Paris summit on climate. And it was really exciting because countries came in with big pledges. They pledged, you know, um, I'll just show you, these are these um, intended nationally determined commitments, the INDCs, intended nationally determined commitments to reduce greenhouse gases. Now, business as usual takes us, no action takes us up to 8 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 and a half degrees centigrade warming, or, or actually more now. Um, but these big commitments, 40% reduction by the EU, 
28% reductions by the US and Australia. You know, big reductions. He's saying, we promise in the next 15 years to cut our emissions tremendously. That's still, even if everyone lived up to their bargain, that still only gets us to this reduction down to three and a half degrees centigrade warming. And all the impact scientists that I've been working with, with the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, have pretty much set two degrees, two degrees centigrade as a level above which there will be dangerous impacts. You know, ecosystems will fall apart. If the Earth warms above two degrees warming, it's going to get nasty. So please stay below two degrees centigrade. Nothing magic about two degrees, but you know these assessments have been going on and on every five years, and they get better and better. The assessments are, it gets nasty above two degrees warming. So how do we ratchet success? How do we get down there? And here's my bias, because I'm a health guy, right? You know, to get immediate and substantial action, I feel really strongly, strongly, and I've felt this way for 20 years, and keep feeling stronger about it, that climate change is a health issue, and it's really important to talk about it with the health frame. I think there's more common ground when you talk about the health effects of climate change, and there'll be more incentive to, to go faster, further on, on solving the problem. From the Paris Agreement, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was asked a follow-up question. Well, what would it take to stay below 2 degrees centigrade? What do we have to do with our energy policies to stay below 2 degrees centigrade warming? And if possible, can what would it take to stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade warming? And what might the difference be? So this report just came out in October. And this is a report, you all have heard this in the news. Uh, once I get to the punchline, I'll show you. So the report is called Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Centigrade and an assessment of that. And what does it take to stay that? To stabilize at 1.5 degrees warming, this is where, what you've heard in the news, that we will have to cut emissions, mostly burning fossil fuels, but also cutting rainforests is a problem. But we have to cut emissions 45% by the year 2030 and be net carbon zero by 2050. So you have heard, you know, now it's 2019. So by 2030, that's 11 years. You know, last year you heard the big news. We have 12 years. You've heard um, Fridays for the Future, the, the children protesting, saying, why should we go to school? You know, what's our future? If you guys don't do something about climate change, and we only have 11 years left, we have no future. You are spending our future. So this is, you, you saw this news. You've heard about it. This is the idea. We have 11 years to get our act together and really go be serious about cutting emissions. Challenging, maybe. I argue that cutting climate change could be free, even a net gain. Remember the title of my talk, Golden Opportunity in Solving Clim the Climate Crisis? Um, we've started publishing on this, Golden Opportunities, Solving the Global Climate Crisis, the Greatest Health Opportunity of Our Times. Why? Well. Look at the energy sector. From dirty energy, and this is something you all probably know already, you know, air pollution kills 7 million people every year prematurely, according to the World Health Organization and the Global Burden of Disease Report. Air pollution kills a lot of people, especially burning coal and oil and dirty energy. Food systems, you know, <coughs> chronic diseases, from you know, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes, and diabetes. You know, having um, an unhealthy diet is also environmentally unfriendly. 
Um, a high red meat diet is environmentally unfriendly and not great for our cardiovascular systems. Uh, in poor countries, uh, I don't advocate no meat. You know, meat is important in many places in the world, but in very rich countries, uh, overabundance of, of red meat uh, is, is uh, a problem with chronic disease. And finally, transportation. Uh, it's estimated now that physical inactivity, mostly because of automobile overdependence, is killing more than 5 million people every year from sedentary lifestyles. So if you look at these big health problems, a low carbon economy could be a huge boon, a huge benefit for health. Here's an analysis um, published in Nature Climate Change, uh, came out of MIT. They looked at a systems approach of um, a clean energy system for the United States. And it, it, you know, it's complicated what, what it means to have this clean energy system. But basically, a clean energy um, economy in the United States. And with that, what would the air quality change be? You know, cleaner air from cleaner energy. And this is straight from their abstract, that the health benefits could offset the investment costs of that clean, tech, clean energy anywhere between 26% and 1,050% of the, of the US uh, carbon investment, you know, trying to get to low carbon. So the health benefit from clean air could be anywhere from a quarter to 10 times greater in value than investing in the clean energy. Um, this uh, study comes um, was derived from a Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin study done a little bit earlier, where we only looked at the US. This is now looking globally, that the investment cost of not emitting one ton of CO2, so having clean energy so that you avoid emitting one ton of CO2, which is the most abundant greenhouse gas, might cost $30 in clean energy technology. It might cost $30. Well, what happens when you don't burn coal and oil that creates greenhouse gas emissions like CO2? You also don't emit dangerous fine particles, PM2.5, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, you know, the nasty pollutants that we know kill people, right? So for every ton of CO2 you don't emit, you're also not emitting all those nasty, harmful air pollutants. So much so that the clean air benefit from just looking at reduced fine particles, PM 2.5, would be equivalent, would be $200 in avoided mortality and hospitalization um, from that improvement in air quality. So when I'm in the state legislature, I've asked them, I said, OK, I want you to take a deep breath. I'm going to ask you a really tough question based on this. You know, look at the $200 and look at the $30 and ask yourself, which number is bigger? <laughs> and the answer I got was, well, we were only thinking about the investment side on the left. We, we didn't know. We weren't thinking about, well, the, the health benefit from clean air would be enormous. And I was happy that they said that, that they admitted that we really hadn't thought of that. But it's a much bigger number. So the health benefits from clean energy are enormous, and even in much even higher in places like India and China, where you have really more serious air pollution. But looking at that $30, I question if it's that expensive. Look at the cost of solar energy. It's dropped 99% in several decades. And um, solar and wind have dropped 80% and 30% respectively in the last seven years. Uh, my colleague, Greg Nemet, just came out with a book. He got a, uh, a, a grant to write a book on why on earth solar energy dropped way faster than anyone ever imagined. And he's a professor here you know, who's analyzed that. You know what? We have been shocked by how fast the price of solar has dropped. So we're not waiting for solutions. We're not waiting for cheap energy solutions. You know? So renewables are, are here. They're cheap. But there's always an argument, right? 
What about jobs? Hey, what about the fossil fuel jobs? Well, this is from the 2017 U.S. Energy and Employment Report showing one million U.S. jobs in renewable energy. That's five times more employment compared to jobs in coal, oil, and gas combined as far as energy. And you know, for me, jobs and income is health. So the job story, you know, now, I, I have an MD behind my name. <laughs> and so, you know, we would be really stupid if we don't show serious compassion for coal miners and coal mining communities. They will become a, they're now a vulnerable population in this energy transition. We absolutely cannot burn any more coal, but we better take care of those communities that depend on coal and be serious about investing and helping those people because they are now a vulnerable population. Absolutely have to take care of coal miners, but we cannot be burning more coal. Uh, one of our uh, superstar graduate students um, did this report when asked, you know, can Wisconsin create all of its energy from in-state sources? You know, right now we spend 14 billion out of state. We send 14 billion out of state to bring in coal-fired electricity, dirty electricity that we're shipping money out of state. Can, can we create all that energy from inside Wisconsin? And the analysis was number one, can, you know, switching to an entirely electric economy from 100% in-state clean power. Is it possible? The answer was yes. The answer was yes, um, and it was about like 35% wind, 30% solar, conservation measures, and about 6% uh, nuclear. Keep nuclear, don't get rid of it, but don't expand it. Um, so those were some of the main energy sources. Yes, we can produce all of our power in state, and it would create 162,000 net new jobs. Um, you would save the $14 billion and actually generate another uh, Thirteen million billion dollars uh, for the G uh, state GDP, and as far as health, the clean air quality. You know, we're talking about avoided health damages, and a lot of this is mortality uh, of twenty-one billion dollars a year. So, oh my God, why don't we do this? Why don't we save money in Wisconsin, create jobs, have healthier environment, and Let's go, you know. There's no, there's no reason not to do that. Uh, okay, food sector, food systems. Can you read that in the back? I am full of greenhouse gas. Do you have a stake in it? This is from the uh, People's Climate March uh, in New York a few years ago. Um, so this is something that you all know that, you know, a high meat diet. This is looking at a high meat diet here. Uh, is very harmful for the environment. This is looking at CO2 equivalents as far as water, energy, fertilizer, feed, all the stuff that goes into uh, producing a, a gram of protein from a high meat diet is very hard on the environment. This is a low meat diet, fish, vegetarian, vegan. So eating lower on the food chain is healthier for the environment and for our cardiovascular systems. Um, there are studies showing, you know, less meat in the diet, less saturated fat, reduced heart attacks, a bunch of studies like that. We also have to think outside of the box. Thinking about food sources, um, I know the Impossible Burger is here, you know, plant-based uh, plant food, but something else. I've got a student uh, who's been, actually she's a postdoc now, working on entomophagy. Did any of you come to our Swarm to Table event? You know, Farm to Table? Swarm to Table. We had a, an expert in edible insects. A chef come from New York, and then the World Authority from Holland came over. So we have to be thinking outside of the box. Think about, you know, look at this comparison in looking at red meat, uh, so, so live, uh, red meat and pork, chickens, and crickets. 
comparing the feed conversion, how much food you have to put into this, you know, and water and land use, you know, cutting rainforest for pastures, that's terrible, right? So crickets for, and insects for feed for chickens or grinding up cricket powder, which is a really amazing protein, and putting it into things. People don't have to eat insects. And there is the yuck factor in this country and many countries. But, but 2 billion people around the world eat insects by choice, not, not because of poverty. So we have to be thinking this way about um, you know, possible futures. OK. Another one of my postdocs, uh, Jason Vargo, came up with this uh, term, metro sapiens. Since uh, 2006, there are now more people, for the first time in history, that live in cities compared to c the countryside. So more of us are urban dwellers, right? So we are metro sapiens. I want to ask you another tough question. I want, to look at, I want you to look at the next picture, and I want you to ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> and many people would argue that, that we have designed our cities, especially in the United States, we've designed our cities to, uh, th we've designed out routine exercise. Now, if you're in a wheelchair, of course, you take the, uh, the elevator around the back. You know, you don't take an escalator. So we've designed cities like this. And US transportation, which is very automobile dependent, has contributed to sedentary lifestyles. In our country, there are 60% of Americans do, that do not even meet the minimum level of physical activity. So that's a crisis. That's a problem. And you know, we have terrible, you know, rates of obesity in adults and children are very significant. 600,000 people die of heart attacks every year. But here's the golden opportunity. Almost half of car trips are really short trips. You know, and I, you know, I have a car. Uh, now, I, I bike because it's more convenient in Madison, and luckily, you know, we live in a city that's very bikeable. It's platinum rate for bike, ranked for bikeability. But most people in America live in cities that are not like Madison. And it's really, it's, it's, it's criminal that people do not have a choice in their transportation. I can choose to bike, but if I, well, when I lived in Baltimore, when I was working, at, when I was at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, I rode my bike into work twice, and I said, "Wow, is that too dangerous? <laughs> no way. That physical fitness, you know, it's forget it. It's just, it's not by design. I'd be taking my life in my hands. So, you know, the the fact that we have so many short car trips that could be bikeable, we need better mass transit. Not everybody can bike." People are injured. People have, are, have, you know, not everybody can get around on a bike or walking. So we have to have really effective transit, mass transit, and options for active transportation, walking and biking. When you look at these, 60% of Americans don't even meet the minimum levels of exercise. Let me compare a couple places in the US, uh, looking at uh, how driving drives obesity. In Washington, DC, they rank number one for leaving their car behind, taking mass transit, either walking or biking. They are ranked number one for active travel. And as far as uh, disease, they, they would rank number one, but there's too much stress in Washington, so they rank, <laughs> they rank number three. Versus Alabama, you know, they are you know, dead last for driving. They have, no, they have terrible mass transit. They don't take mass transit. They don't walk. They don't bike because they can't. Yeah. You know, it's not personal choice. And because of the incredible obesity rates in Alabama, a part of it is food. Yes, food is part of it. But I would argue this is an ethical challenge that they don't even have access if they wanted to be able to, to commute in an active way. And Wisconsin, we're somewhere, you know, we're in the middle somewhere. So this is where 
Urban design, what a golden opportunity for improving our health. Um, so we done, we've done studies looking at, you know, what if you shifted transportation? What if you had more biking? Um, comparing cities around the United States, the cities with the highest rates of walking and biking have obesity rates and diabetes rates 20% and 23% lower than the cities that, you know, have the lowest rates of active travel. And of course, exercise has many other benefits. Heart disease reduction, cancer reduction, dementia, depression, all these things. Exercise is really great. Uh, one of my students, uh, Maggie Grabo, did this study where we, uh, the headline was swapping tailpipes for pedals. Small changes could pay huge dividends uh, for public health and the economy. We found that if we could get those short car trips off the roads in the 11 largest cities in the Midwest, just in the metropolitan area, um, and turn half of those car trips only in the summertime, you don't need the, you know, the uh, studded tires, just summertime biking half the time for those short car trips, we would save 1,300 lives every year and um, billions of dollars in avoided uh, mortality and hospitalization. So, you know, golden opportunity. And finally, uh, how we design our cities, not only for active travel, but for green space. And that there are studies, this is a study out of Milwaukee showing that green space reduces depression, stress, and anxiety very significantly, almost like moving and divorce. I mean, big numbers as far as mental health effects of green space. Um, so designing cities for people, you know, for mental health, for physical fitness, golden opportunity. This is a brand new study this year out of Denmark showing the association between the relative risk of developing any psychiatric disorder in children, comparing the level of green space across the urban environment, the su su suburban environment, any place they went, they saw, you know, the more, more green space led to less psychiatric disorders. So mental health benefit. So I'll wrap up by talking about attitudes on climate change. This is a colleague of mine, uh, Ed Maybach. He's one of the, these really smart guys that looks at climate change communication and attitudes. He and his colleague at Yale, um, uh, L L uh, Tony Lesirowitz have published something called The Six Americas, showing, you know, people that are alarmed, alarmed, concerned, um, cautious, disengaged, um, what does that say? Doubtful. Yeah, and then dismissive, right? Right. Yeah. So never before in the United States, and this is from la 2018, the most recent survey, across America, never before in the US uh, has the public been more ready to hear about actions on the global climate crisis. Right now, almost 60% of people are alarmed or concerned. That's the highest it's been. So re just, re you know, forget about the politics in Washington. If you poll Americans, we're at a very high level of, of concern for doing something. And of course, there's now, uh, the Citizens Climate Lobby has been working through this bipartisan climate coalition in, in Congress. So in the House, there's this uh, climate solution, this uh, Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, the idea that it's not a carbon tax, but it's money back to people, putting a carbon dividend. And from my background in public health, I say, what do we know about preventive measures, about one of the biggest killers that we know, smoking? Youth smoking dropped precipitously when cigarette prices rose. So I argue that, you know, like tobacco, it's time for a real price on carbon. Uh, but parallel to the tobacco companies, the fossil fuel companies are putting tons of climate change disinformation campaigns around that, you know, climate change is not real, don't believe it. But here's my argument. Regardless of one's views on climate change science, 
we can all agree on safe routes to school, physically fit children and adults from, from cities designed for people, not just for cars, clean air from low carbon energy, green jobs and lots of them, reduce stress and depression and anxiety from, from green, green cities. So even if you don't believe in climate change, climate change, it's real, it's now, it's serious. But even if you don't believe it, I mean, what a golden opportunity. You know, a low carbon economy gives us all these amazing health opportunities. So with that, I want to reinforce that climate change is absolutely a health issue. And clean energy, a clean energy economy offers health opportunities. And because it's all about communication and talking more about the global climate crisis, not less, to talk more about it, um, you can take a 19-minute version of this talk that you just heard, because uh, I did a TEDx at Oshkosh. So you can spread this um, to all your networks. And I see some young people here. You have bigger networks, right? <laughs> so spread this, help, help this go viral. You can just Google my name and TEDx and take my 19-minute TEDx talk and send it to all your friends. So with that, um, I thank you very much for your attention.